Okay, welcome everyone to the Siyum Masechet Megillah. We're very excited to be here together to celebrate as we get every month another, another uh, Siyum celebration. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. We have a bunch of special sponsors. Siyum Masechet Megillah is sponsored by Sharon Goldberg and loving memory of her father. Yechez Kalbein Yerachmiel on the occasion of his 11th year at sight. He was a kind and gentle man, a devoted son and brother, and a wonderful father and grandfather. Yehizeh Baruch. Siyum is also sponsored by Rina and Sachi Goldberg in loving memory of Chaim Shalom Ben Aharon Mendel Kurtz on his 46th year at on the 26th of Shvat, and to Penina by Yechezkel Goldberg on her 13th year at on the 21st of Adar. She shares a year at with the ancestor, with her ancestor, the Noam Elimelech. And it's also sponsored by Sharon Russ and family in memory of her mother, Sima Bat Estrella, who just had her shloshi. My mother was taken from us suddenly and tragically. She was born in the old city of Jerusalem in 1942. She faced many challenges in her life, including her visual disability from birth and persevered with profound faith, strength, and determination. Although she wasn't given the opportunity to study past the eighth grade, she was extremely wise and all gravitated to her to get advice, love, and support. She was totally devoted to her family, giving unconditional love. As kids, we called her the drill sergeant. She was adventurous and full of life and spread joy and happiness to all. She touched the lives of so many and will be sorely missed. May her neshama have an aliyah. And one last minute dedication by Emma and Richard Rimberg for refuash lema to their beloved daughter, Rachel, Rachel Ophira Bat Nechama Lea Esther. And I, we can't go on without talking about how our hearts are with the Jews in Colleyville, Texas, what, what happened yesterday and, and their families, and also with the, the soldiers that were involved in the incident. Unfortunately, those who were also murdered, uh, sorry, not murdered, killed by accident by a tragic incident last week in Israel. And it's hard to have a celebration without mentioning those uh, difficult things that are going on right now. Okay, with that, we will get started with our daf. We have a very interesting daf, a kind of I would say somewhat not expected way to end our Masechet with a whole bunch of different comments about how to handle Sifrei Torah, all sorts of rules, which might, you know, might be familiar, might, many of them might not be very familiar to people. So we're going to learn them together, starting from the top of Lamed Bet Amud Aleph. Tanu Rabbanan, poter v'ro'e golel u'mevarech v'chozer u'poter v'kore. Divrei Rabbi Meir. We're going to see a machlok at Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, which if you remember, since our daf was already a few days ago, you might not remember, but we also ended with a machlok at, um, on the previous daf between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, to which then we had a, we, Rabbi Zera decided who we were going to paskin like. And then the Gemara asked, why didn't he just say the halacha is like Rabbi Yehuda? He kind of described what the halacha was. And then they said, well, that's because sometimes people switch who said what. We're going to have a very similar thing here. When you open the Torah to make a bracha, so first you open the bracha, you're about to read from the Torah, you go, you open it, you roe, you see exactly what spot we're up to, golel, you close it, okay, you roll it up again, umivarech, and then you make the bracha. Vechozir upotech the after you make the blessing, then you open it up again. So we're going to have to figure out why Rabbi Meir thinks that we do this. This is Divrei Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, poter v'ro'e u'mevarech v'kore. He says, we open it, we look, and then once we look exactly where the spot is, you make the bracha right then and there. De'amar ula, uh, my time at the Rabbi Meir. So what's the reason why Rabbi Meir says you have to close the Torah in order to make the bracha? It seems strange. So he says, kid ula, de'amar ula, as ula says, mipnei ma amru ha'kore b'torah lo yesaya l'matur geman, so first of all, I want to just say what type of an answer this is. The way the Gemara works here, and it's very typical of the Gemara, they take an answer given in a different situation, and they say that same answer would be applicable here as well. So what's the answer? So the answer is, or what's the issue, the other issue? The other issue is, we learned already from, this is nice because it connects back with things we learned earlier in the Masechet. When they used to read the Torah, they would have a mature gaman. This is still done in Yemenite synagogues. Somebody reads a pasuk and immediately someone else translates it. Okay, translates it into right, reading the Targum Unculus. Wouldn't really help most of us, but maybe after learning a lot of Gemara, you'll get better at understanding Targum Unculus. So, 
they would basically say that the person who reads the Torah is not allowed, not only not allowed to translate the Gemara, the, the Torah, but also can't help the person translating. Let's say the person translating starts fumbling. You can't help them. Okay, you can't say any of the words of the translation if you're the one reading the Torah. Why is that? Well, you're going to find this, I think, a little bit strange. They don't want people to think that the Targum, the translation, was actually written in the Torah. We had this whole thing about, can you translate the Torah? Can you translate the Torah? Remember, and the whole thing was about preserving the text of the Torah and understanding that the text of the Torah is the text of the Torah. If you want to start translating, that's fine, but understand that what you're using is a translation, right? I always say this when, you, when you're learning Gemara and you take the Steinsaltz or the Schattenstein and, and you're using it. Always remember that, right, the, the, that what you're using is the translation. It's not the actual text. They're already taking away, right, some of the, the purity of the text itself. And what they want to keep here is the purity of the Torah. The tra- you don't want anyone to think that maybe the translation was written in the Torah. So therefore, you can't do that. So comes now here. Okay, that makes sense when it comes to the Targum. The next line is a little bit more strange, which is hachanami. We can then say the same thing, that when you say the bracha, you have to cover the Torah. Why? We don't want anyone to think that the bracha were written inside the Torah. Right? That's already why someone would think that the bracha were written inside the Torah is a very good question. Don't have a great answer to that question. But they say it must be, because they can't think of any other reason why you would cover the Torah when making the bracha, because we don't want people to think that the bracha are written in the Torah. Again, it's this idea of keeping the purity of the text. The text of the Torah is the text of the Torah. Anything else that we do, we, we say bracha, we give the targum, we give the translation, all of that is extra, additional. But that's not the Torah itself. So if you have to, def- you have to say what this stuff is all about, it's really about the sanctity of the Torah and how pure we have to keep the sanctity of the Torah and not to mix it up with anything else. So now Rabbi Yehuda, why does Rabbi Yehuda think then you can open it? Because he says, He says, I understand that you might confuse and think the Targum maybe was written in the Torah, but nobody's going to think that the blessings were written in the Torah. So there's no concern at all. And Amar Rabbi Zeira, Amar of Matna, I already alluded to the fact that we're going to get to this Psaq Halacha. He says, You actually don't need to close the Torah. So now the Gemara asks, just like they asked before on Rabbi Zera, why don't we say the halacha is like Rabbi Yehuda? Why did Rabbi Zera say in words, I hold by whatever Rabbi Yehuda does, but he didn't say very simply, I hold like Rabbi Yehuda. That would have been very simple. The answer is mishum lehu, because some people switch who said what, and therefore we want to make it very clear. So we're going to say, he said it explicitly what the answer is, what the halacha is so that you don't get confused. What do we do halacha lamase? So this is very interesting. We hold like Rabbi Yehuda that you actually don't need to cover it up. However, there's many customs that developed and, and it's quoted la halacha in the halacha books that you're actually either you close your eyes or you look to the right. Some people say you look to the left. There's different opinions. And that generally, you're not really supposed to look inside the Torah when you're doing the brachot. Basically, even though we hold like Rabbi Yehuda, to be concerned for Rabbi Meir's opinion, where generally the custom is not to actually look at the Torah, look down in the Torah when you're making the bracha. Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rav Matna, since we quoted, we're going to have a lot of these things today where we quoted someone saying something, so we're going to quote something else that he says, and it's obviously somewhat connected. Haluchot v'habimot, ein behemishum kedusha. Another thing that typifies our daf is that, as usual, we're going to have a lot of terms that aren't so clear what they mean or explanations that were not so clear what they meant by following statements and many different interpretations. We're going to try to keep it simple today for our CM, but Luchot and Bimot, there's different uh, interpretations of what they are. Some people say Luchot are the margins in the Torah text. Some people say they're you know, on the parchment of the Torah. Some people say that they're boards that the children used in school that they wrote the Torah on. And then the Luchot and the Bimot, some people say the Bima is the place where we put the Torah. Some people have some other interpretations of it. Ein behem ishum kedusha, they don't have sanctity of a Sefer Torah. Some people say they do have sanctity of a Beit Knesset, of a Shul, which is a lower level of sanctity, but they don't have the higher level sanctity. Amar Rabbi Shvatya, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Hagolel Sefer Torah, we're now going to have a number of statements of Rabbi Shvatya. 
Someone who rolls a Sefer Torah, Tzarich Sheyamidenu Al HaTefer. When you roll the Sefer Torah, you have to roll it so that the center that's right, that as you're rolling it, the, the center has the Tefer, the stitching. Because what are we worried about? That's exactly the point, which it could be weak and it could tear. And if it's not on the, on the stitching, then you could actually maybe rip the Sefer Torah where the wording is. So you have to be very careful. So I'm going to first translate the words. It's very unclear what this means. Rabbi Shvatya says, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, that if you roll the Sefer Torah, you roll it from the outside and not from the inside. Many, many different interpretations were given to this line. And when you close it, Okay, when you seal it or close it up, you close it from the inside, not from the outside. So when you roll it, you roll it from the outside. When you, when you seal it you, or close it, you close it from the inside. So what does this mean? It's not so clear what this means. And I'll, like I said, there's many different interpretations. I'm going to go with the Ramah and the Shulchan Aruch. And he explains, if you look in Hochot Sefer Torah and Orach Hayim Kuf Mem Zayin, if you want to open this up at some point, in Seif Dalit, it says exactly word for word in the Shulchan Aruch, Basically cuts out a few words, but he says word for word what it says in the Gemara. And the Ramah who writes his comments on the Shulchan Aruch said, Perush, okay, basically said, I understand that you probably didn't understand what that meant. So I'm going to explain to you what the Shulchan Aruch meant when he said this. And what he meant is when a sefer omed lefanav, yaktav neged panav, when the sefer is in front of you, the writing is should be facing you. You should be looking at the writing. And then, that means you wrap it from the out, you roll it from the outside so that you're facing and you're looking at the text because the text is what's important. You don't want to be looking at the backside of the Torah. And then when you when you close it, right? we have these clasps or different kinds of straps that go around almost like a belt. When you seal it, you should do it mibifnim. Okay, and then here I'll actually look if on the daf at Tosfot. Tosfot says in Golilomi Bachutz, if you look a few lines down, he says, Kishiftach Sefer Torah, yet sarich lav chol aktav la tira kesher, the enzaderach kavod. If you fasten it on the backside of the Torah, then what's going to happen when you go to open it? You're going to have to put the Torah flat on its backside. That's not going to be an appropriate way of respecting the Torah. So therefore, you do it in a way that the clasp is in the front facing the wording, that way you can open it. Okay, so those are the two different methods. Then, Amarav Shvati, Amarav Yochanan, another thing he says, Asara shekaru b'Torah, hagadol shebahem golel sefer Torah. He says, if 10 people read from the Torah, which you have to wonder why are 10 people reading from the Torah? So some people say what this really means is not 10 people reading from the Torah. If there's 10 people in shul, then which one do you choose to do galila? Okay, the, the rolling. But, some people say that it's 10 people, it's the seven readers on Shabbat, it's the Chazan, it's the, um, it's the, what is it also? They came, uh, forget, but they came up with a way to get to 10. Okay, so maybe that's it. And actually, it's very relevant, the Machloket here, because it means, okay, well, let me read and then I'll tell you why there's a big ramification of whether you say it's 10 people who actually read from the Torah, or it's 10 people who are in shul when they're reading from the Torah, the most prominent among them does the rolling. Now, does this happen in your shul? Okay, anyone? Not usually, okay? Usually it's not. The one who does galila, often they pick a child to do it, okay? They pick someone who's young and doesn't have a lot of experience, maybe hagba to raise it. They pick someone a little bit more important. First of all, they claim the galila used to be hagba and galila. The person who rolled it did both. Okay, that's number one. Another thought occurred to me now is that maybe after all these warnings about how to do it properly and it's a little bit dangerous, you could possibly tear it on the scene. Maybe they people didn't want to do this job and they therefore said, oh, we're going to pick the most respected person in the community so that people would actually want the job and it would be, as we call it, a kibbutz. And that would encourage people to do it. So we'll see why we don't actually do this anymore. But according to the Gemara, it's really Hagadol Shabahen. He rolls the Sefer Torah. And whether you assume it's the, the greatest among the people who read from the Torah, or maybe it means, no, the people read the Torah and 
we pick somebody else to do glila, there's a big machloket about this among the poskim. Is the right nowadays, generally, I unless you tell me otherwise, but generally the person who does glila is not one of the people who read the Torah, which we just use as an opportunity to give it to somebody else. But when, uh, but according to the Gemara, there are some people who think that the Gemara reads as we choose of the people who read the Torah, the one who is the more prominent is the one who gets Kalila. And then it tells you even more, he gets the reward of everybody. To which the Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, as Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, here he said it, it must be that's the case. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute, how could he take the reward of all the people who read the Torah? Here you roll the Torah and you get the reward of everybody. It means he got as much reward as all of them put together. Got. So you can see here, they're clearly encouraging people to do glila, right? It seems like that's one way to look at it. Or they really thought that rolling the Torah was an incredibly big uh big job and very important and given to the most important person. Why do I say this? Because again, this doesn't match the reality. Okay. I, what I didn't mention is Sephardi Sefer Torahs are very different and how they would read the sugya is a big question because they don't have all this wrapping around and, and other things. Although they do use mitpachot and they, they do have other things, but how you read it would be a good question. But what I wanted to read here is the Mishnah Brura. The Mishnah Brura in Kufmem Zayin, Sif Katan Zayin says, this is the real base halacha that the Golilo is supposed to do all this. This is nowadays people don't really do this, and they have regular people do this. Why? It's very interestingly, Mishum Darke Shalom. Okay, we're going to get to Darke Shalom later on in Shas. The very interesting thing, which is in order to prevent fighting between people, right? If you give it to the biggest person in the shul, well, everybody knows what's going to happen. You're going to say, oh, he got it. I didn't get it. She got it. I didn't get what, what's going on here, right? So it's very important to keep peace within the shul. So we don't want to start pointing at who do we think is the greatest person and who, who not. And therefore, the halacha changed because of that, which is very interesting. And then he points out that not only that, but now we even give it to younger children. So there you see the Mishabru already had the custom that we have, which is that often we give it to younger children. And that's our, okay, so that's this halacha. Moving on. Um, okay, if you, now we get to the most strange line of our daf, okay? Because we quoted other things he says, he now says, How do we know that you can listen to a, he, to a voice that you hear? Okay, whether it's a heavenly voice or just a voice, we don't know. But if you start hearing voices, you can follow what the voices tell you to do. Okay, now this is very difficult because the Torah says, achashu. you're not supposed to follow voices. We've seen in the Gemara that we don't follow the Batkol. We don't listen to heavenly voices. Famous story of Tanur Rosh and other stories we've seen. We don't follow Batkol. So why are we listening to this heavenly voice or whatever kind of voice it is? So the Gemara here says, you can, tishmana davar in Sefer Yeshua, it says, if your ears hear something from behind you, speaking and telling you, then you should, it says, Lemor, Zeha derech lechubo, this is the path that you should go. Kita aminu vechita smilu, whether, right, whether you go, you mean or small, basically it sounds like you can follow this voice. So how does that work with Lotan Achashu? All the commentaries really question this. And it seems that they distinguish between this idea of, of, th- this is like you want to go somewhere and you just need some sort of push to go there. So if you think you hear some voice telling you to do this, you can follow it. But it's not the same as the Torah prohibition of Lotan Achashu. I'm going to leave it at that. It's obviously a little bit more complicated, but we're going to move on. The Han and Mile, here we're now going to define, well, how do you know that this is a voice that one should follow? So this gets even more strange. If you hear the voice of a man in the city and the voice of a woman in the fields. Now, some people say, okay, you've got to wonder why this is. Why is the man of the voice in the city and the man of the woman in the field? So some people say it's normally the opposite. So it's atypical for you to hear the voice of the woman in the fields because the women were more at home in the cities and the men were out in the fields. So if you hear some other strange voice, maybe that's something, some voice that you should basically go follow. It tells you yes, yes, or it tells you no, no, you can go follow that voice. 
Okay, now the double is coming from the Torah. Often when God calls people, he calls them Avraham, Avraham. Okay, we see that many times where names are doubled. Okay, and that maybe is a, is a sign that it comes from God. Again, this is very odd. What this is doing here, the only thing I could really think about is that to me, this connects with the whole idea of the Megillah and how God's name is hidden in the Megillah. And that many times we say, we're waiting for a sign from God, right? We want to know what should we do? We're waiting for a sign from God. And sometimes the idea is that the signs from God are there and it's our job to see them. Just like God in the Megillah is hidden and it's our job to find God in the Megillah and, and see that God was behind everything without it being obvious and, and noticeable. So I think that that's an idea here that all of a sudden jumps out at me. If you think about the Megillah in general, even though we're really not on the topic of Megillah, but you can't ignore the fact that we're at the end of Masecha Megillah. Okay. Another thing he says, another, again, these are off, awfully interesting statements, I should say. If you read the Torah without the, the sing-song tune, okay, that I understand. Okay, there's laning, there's a tune, that's important. But if you learn your Mishnayot without singing them, Okay, this is a verse in Sefer Yechezkel, which says, I'm going to give them laws that are no good. In other words, this is no good. You have to sing your Torah, okay? I don't think you really want me singing to you, but that's what it says here, that one should sing Torah, and I just don't have a good voice, so that's why I don't think you want me singing. Um, but the idea is the Torah should be sung and it should be pleasant, right? Music is pleasant to our ears. Um, the gamma, the toast vote in Shonei Belo Zimra says, that's how you remember things, right? I remember my kids when they were learning for tests, they always did it with songs. It's a good way to memorize things. So songs are a good way to help you memorize. And remember, Mishnayot were meant to be memorized. So it's an excellent way to remember what you're doing. Okay, next. Matkif Labaya. Abaya says, what are you talking about? If you don't sing that, those are statutes that are not, that are not good? What do you mean? You don't have to sing. So Abai says, That's the end of that verse. The end of that verse is, you're, going, you're not going to live by these rules, okay? You're, you're going to end up dying. But that's pretty harsh. Ella, so Abai says, it must not be that. He says, no, it's talking about that learn with each other and fight with each other in a bad manner, right? There's a way to have a, a conversation of Torah in a respectful manner and not in a disrespectful manner. And if you learn Torah in a disrespectful manner and disagree with someone in a disrespectful way, that is you're not going to live by your learning. That's not learning that's going to sustain you. If you hold a Sefer Torah naked, you will be buried naked. Now, what do we mean by naked here? Again, you could say maybe it's defining the person or maybe it's defining the Sefer Torah. It means that you're touching it without anything in between you and the Sefer Torah. You're touching the raw Sefer Torah. Okay, that then you will be buried naked. So the Gemara says, Arom Salkadatach. What are you talking about? Nobody's buried naked. We always put shrouds on people. And la ema nigbar arom below mitzvah. You'll be buried naked of mitzvah. All your mitzvah will kind of disappear. To which the Gemara says, I still don't understand that. Below mitzvah, Salkadatach. What do you mean? You're not going to have, oh, because you touched the Sefer Torah, everything you did in your whole life disappears. El Amar Abai nigbar arom below otam mitzvah. You won't get that mitzvah which is strange. Obviously, you won't get that mitzvah of giving respect to the Sefer Torah. You didn't do that. This isn't an extra thing. So Tosfet actually says, what it means is if you read the Torah and you touched it while you were reading it, then you lose the mitzvah of having read the Torah. Okay, that anything you did with it kind of disappears. Here we're getting the whole generation. He said it from, right, from Rabbi Yanai. The elder who said it from the Rabbiana, the elder of him. Again, respect for a Torah. Again, the reality, it's not so clear to me exactly how this works, but wrap the, 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 the cover of the Torah around the Torah and don't wrap the Torah to fit into the cover. But you, okay, that's the end of Sefer Torah. Now we're going to have our last line for today. First, we quote the Mishnah. If you remember, the Mishnah had listed all the readings you're supposed to do on all the given days. And it said, we learn this all from a verse about the holidays that says, Moshe spoke the Moadei Hashem to B'nai Israel. 
mitzvatan shukorim kol echad echad bizmano. This teaches you that the mitzvah is to read about each holiday in its appropriate time when the holiday is. To which the Gemara brings in a brayta, which is not exactly the same idea. And I want to kind of end with this idea, which is Tanu Rabbanan. Moshe came in Israel, Shusho Alim Bidorshim Binyanoshal Yom. The rabbis instituted that when it's a holiday, you should ask and learn the halachot of that day. All the holidays should, you should learn those holiday, those uh, laws on that day. Why does the Masechet end with this? And what does this have to do with Megillah? And why did Megillah end up with, right? We asked this question at the beginning. Um, why did Megillah end up with all these chapters about Sefer Torah, about Beit Knesset? So I think there's a bit of a clue at the end of this Masechet. And this might also be why they ended with this chapter in the Gemara, not the previous. They wanted to end with this idea of reading Bismano. We started with that, remember? When is the Megillah Nikrei? For your Aleph, your Bet, your Gimel, your Dalit Tefav, right? And then we said, how could it be read in all those days? And then we said, well, it says in the Megillah, Bismanehem, in their appropriate times, and they have multiple appropriate times that it could be read. And therefore, we end with this idea that we read on the holidays, Bismano, and we read on Purim Bismano, Bismano there is a little bit different, but it's the same kind of concept. And then what I wanna talk about at the very end here is this idea that we've been comparing all along. And we actually notice probably more differences in Kriyat HaTorah and reading the Torah than Kriyat Megillah, right? We saw, let's say, Trey Kale Lo Mishtame. You can't, two people can't read Torah together, but two people can read Megillah, even 10 people can read Megillah at the same time. And we saw these laws, for example, today, don't apply to a Megillah. We, we touch a Megillah. We don't have any, we don't need to wear gloves or kind of separate or hold a cloth or something like that when we read the Megillah. It's very different than a Sefer Torah. It doesn't have all these laws. So on the one hand, we're comparing them. On the other hand, they're very different. And I think that one of the ideas here, if we think about what is similar though, despite all the differences, if we talk about Megillah, we mentioned that Megillah really doesn't appear in the Megillah. The fact that you're supposed to read the Megillah doesn't appear explicitly in the Megillah. Really what it tells you at the end of the Megillah is you should make these days, days of feasts and, and celebration, and you should do Mishloch Mano, Matano, Lev Yoni, which got such a teeny mention, a very funny mention in our Masechet, but a very, very small mention. And the whole Masechet, other than the parts about Kriyat Torah, are really all about reading the Megillah, which is not even mentioned explicitly. Why is reading the Megillah so important? And I think that the clue could be found in this last line which is reading the Torah. We don't always view the reading the Torah as learning Torah, but there's an element of learning in reading the Torah, right? That's what we read every week. And we always talk about Parshat Shavua. And it's a way that we get to learn and engage with the text in a learning kind of way. And when they said here that the mitzvah is to read every portion in its appropriate time, and then they immediately said, well, it's a mitzvah to learn all the halachas, right? Which are not necessarily in the Torah readings, but there's this idea that the, idea of Torah reading, and then let's take it to Megillah, is that the rabbis, when they created this holiday of Purim, they wanted to create it with something that was a model that they knew already, which was Kriyat Torah and learning, this learning model, and showing the importance of not just experiencing, there's the experiential aspect, which is the Mishloch Manon and the Suda and all of that, but in addition, add this element of learning. And therefore, the merging of the two is what they wanted. And the Megillah, because it wasn't mentioned, they needed, they wanted to stress that part, especially the rabbis who everything for them centered around learning. So I think that that might be an interesting way to look at the idea of reading the Megillah and why the Masechet spends so much time talking about Kriyat Torah, because they wanted to say, this is the model on which we base Kriyat Megillah. And that's why it ends with this idea of Bismano and Bismanehem to merge the two ideas together. And with that, Hadron Alach B'nei Ha'ir, Uslik Ala Masechet Megillah, and now we will say the Hadrons together. Put them up on the screen. Okay. Hadran alach mesechet megila ve hadrachalan. Daatan alach mesechet megila ve daatachalan. Lo neshe minach mesechet megila ve lo tit neshe minan lo baal mahaden lo baal madaate. Hadran alach mesechet megila ve hadrachalan. Daatan alach mesechet megila ve daatachalan. Lo nitnashe minach mesechet megila, the lo titnashe minan, lo baal mahaden, the lo baal madaate. Hadran alach mesechet megila, hadrach alan, the atan alach mesechet megila, the datach alan, lo nitnashe minach mesechet megila, the lo titnashe minan, lo baal mahaden, the lo baal madaate. Yehi ratzom mufanecha, Adonai alohenu velohe avotenu, 
שתהא תורתך אומנותנו בעולם הזה, ותהא עמנו לעולם הבא. חנינה בר פאפה, רמי בר פאפה, נחמן בר פאפה, אחי בר פאפה, אבא בר פאפה, רפרם בר פאפה, רכיש בר פאפה, סורחר בר פאפה, אדר בר פאפה, דרו בר פאפה. הערב נא אדוני אלוהינו את דברי תורתך בפינו ופיפיות עמך בית ישראל ונהיה אנחנו כולנו צאצאינו וצאצאי עמך בית ישראל כולנו יודעי שמך ולומדי תורתך לשמה. מרבי תחכמני מצוותיך כי לעולם היא לי. יהי ליבי תמים בחוקיך למען לא אבוש לעולם לא אשכח פיקודיך כי בם חי איתנו. ברוך אתה אדוני למדני חוקיך אמן 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 סלע ועד. יהי רצון לפניך, אדוני אלוהי, כשם שעזרתני לסיים מסכת מגילה, כן תעזרני להתחיל מסכתות וספרים אחרים ולסיימם, ללמוד וללמד, לשמור ולעשות ולקיים את כל דברי תלמוד תורתך באהבה. וזכות כל התנאים והאמוראים ותלמידי חכמים יעמוד לנו ולזרענו, שלא תמוש התורה מפינו ומפי זרענו עד עולם. יתקיים בנו ותלכך תנחה אותך, ושוכבך תשמור עליך, והקיצותה היא תשיחך. כי בי ירבו ימיך, ויוסיפו לך שנות חיים, אורך ימים בימינה, בשמאלה אושר וכבוד, אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן, אדוני יברך את עמו בשלום. שר כוח לכולם. It's amazing, כל הכבוד. So exciting to finish another מסכת together. We will read the first line of Masechet Moeg Katan. I know many of you already started it, but in case you didn't, here's your intro to the next Masechet. Moeg Katan, I actually thought tonight that it really starts off in a very similar way to the way Masechet Megillah ends, which is Mashkim Beit HaShlachim B'Moed U'Bashvi'it. You're allowed to water a field that needs irrigation on Chal Moed and Bashvi'it, and also in the Shemitah year. I'm not going to get into all the details about how and when and where, but what I'll talk about is the concept of this Mishnah. The concept of this Mishnah is what kind of malacha is forbidden on Cholomoed and what kind of malacha do we allow? And the question is really a question of what, why did the rabbi, and there's a debate about whether one can't do work on Cholomoed by Torah law or it's only rabbinic law. And the question is the rabbis, and if you listen to Dr. Ayala Lipson's um, intro to me, Moe Katan. If you haven't yet, you should definitely listen. She talks about how what happens in, in Moe Katan is that the rabbis are trying to tell you how you're supposed to feel. They're instituting certain things that you can or can't do to create a certain emotion and a certain uh, feeling for the holiday. And I was thinking it's the exact same thing as Megillah, that they instituted that this idea of Megillah that I was talking about in order to have an intellectual experience, that sometimes the rabbis institute things because they want you to have a particular experience, a particular way of looking at it. So in that way, way Katan starts in a sense a little bit similar to the way um, the Megillah, Masechet Megillah ends. With that, we will finish with this section of the, of the uh, Siyum. Thank you for being part of it and for finishing the Masechet with us. Um, before we introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to mention that on Sundays for the next two weeks, if you did miss the first one, Rabbi Leah Sarna is giving an intro to Gemara. And one of the things we don't get into Daf Yomi always is all the background and the intro and the, and, um, the basics, okay? I mentioned them here and there, but this is of course geared toward the basis, the complete beginner's guide to Gemara. If you missed it, it's all online and you can still catch it. And it will be continuing for the next two weeks. And after that, I'll be teaching a skills class for four sessions on Tikkun Olam, which is a little bit similar to Darkei Shalom, a little bit different, but um, for Studio and Gitin, where there we will actually, hopefully those who took the beginner's course will feel the confidence that you can then enter into Chavruta learning and start getting the basic skills. And those, it's also geared toward intermediate learners to advance your skills. So we're always trying to come up with ways to help people both with Dafyomi and get to all the content, but also how to learn how to learn Gemara. Um, and I forgot in the beginning to mention happy Tu B'Shvat to everybody. Um, I thought of doing something Tu B'Shvat related, but it didn't really connect. It's not like Masechet Rosh Hashanah where we could have connected it well. Um, we don't always have learning about the holiday in its appropriate time. And okay, I now want to introduce um, a very uh, speaker who has a very special connection to me, Rabbi Niki LaRosen, who um, when I, I, at some point I spent some time going to Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein's Gemara Shior and Rabbi Niki 
Gila was with me in the class and I looked up to as a uh, as someone who clearly, which, which I only found out today that she not only learned with, um, with Rav Lichtenstein, but also studied with Rav Nachum Rabinovich. So she has a special schut that she learned from Mamash, the Gdole Hador. And uh, she's the Dean Emerita of Yakar. She teaches Talmud and Midrash at Yakar and Nishmat. She's a Yuetzer Halacha, who I've also asked many questions to in the past. And, um, and she's going to speak to us today about what's wrong with holy objects. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, Mazal Tov to all of you. Uh, it's such a wonderful occasion and to Bishvat Sameach. And I apologize if the lighting is a little bit problematic on my screen. I do the best I can. Um, so Masechet um, Megillah, as I'm sure you've experienced, is a wonderful Masechet. It's got lots of halacha, lots of agada, And at the same time, uh, without being too difficult, uh, it actually has um, deals with wonderful, wonderful issues. So it's a totally uh, wonderful. Um, just want to get into a so I can see you. It's a it's a really special and wonderful uh, masechet. One thing masechet Megillah is not, as you saw, and as Mish Rabbanit Michelle was saying, is it's not really a masechet about Purim. People expect it to be a masechet about Purim, but it isn't. It's a masechet about the Megillah both as something that we read on Purim and as a holy object. And once it's a masachet about something we read on Purim, it's also about reading Kriyat Torah and other holy readings. And it becomes a parallel masachet to brachot about a lot of aspects of public prayer. And once it's a masachet about what makes a valid Megillah, it becomes a masachet also about what makes a valid Sefer Torah. And uh, how you create and define holy objects. And one of the things that arises again and again is that not everything we might have expected to be holy is holy. And we see it again and again. Some things are very holy, some things are a little holy, and some things don't make it. And uh, we witness a kind of symptom. Uh, what should we use for the word symptom? A sort of limitation of holiness in two ways, in terms of which things get called holy, which are assigned holiness, are considered to have holiness, and in a question of how we relate to these holy objects. So I want to bring some examples, and then I want to ask why this is so. Um, is there a little bit of a hesitation here with regard to the holiness of objects? I would like to suggest that there is, and to think together why. Uh, we've only got a quarter of an hour, so I, I can't open it up that much, though I really would be happy if somebody wants to suggest something that they interrupt. I'm sure your interruption will be as good as my idea, because we've all been sitting there with this um, masachet. Now, I, I created a source sheet, which I hope was is on the, um, uh, put on the chat, yes, it's on the chat, which is just in Hebrew, just with the original text. Uh, sorry about that. Um, if you want to refer to it, if you want to have it for another occasion, it's uh, associated with some points, mostly in Masech and Megillah, but also in other places where holy objects are related to. And we're not dealing with the Beit HaMikdash, right? The Masech is really not Beit HaMikdash oriented. And the holiness here is not about the Beit HaMikdash. So, where do we start? Well, we're going to start with the Megillah itself, right? Uh, the beginning of the second chap chapter of Masechet Megillah, um, chapter two, the first two Mishnayot, uh, start with defining how you read the Megillah. Not when, that was in the first chapter, but how. And what is a Megillah, right? So a Megillah is supposed to be written with a certain kind of ink. What can it be written on? Has to be written in Ashurit, which is the newer script of Hebrew on a on on a, a right kind of parchment with the right kind of ink, and it's got to be the right text, right? It's got to be in Hebrew. It's got to contain the entire story, etc. Actually, though, in Mishnah, the first Mishnah, there's an exception, which is that if you have a community of people who do not know Hebrew in some country where they don't know Hebrew, in Russia, in communist times, maybe in some parts of America, in, in their times in many communities, then what can you do? 
you can actually write a Megillah on parchment with the right ink and the right parchment and the right text in translation, and it can be a kosher Megillah. Can't do that with a Sefer Torah, as Rabbi Michelle was saying, there's some differences. And for those of you who live near enough, you can find an actual fact uh, you can find such a Megillah if you go to the Bible Lands Museum downstairs. There is a Megillah in Judea Arabic, I think it is, um, on bright, bright kind of parchment, a perfectly kosher Megillah that it looks like was used actually for women from what we can see, um, a Megillah that was not in Hebrew. But except for the fact that in actual fact, in theory, there could can be a Megillah in a translation, except for that, it's very, very specific how you get to write the exact um, object. How do you create the object? Now, it's interesting, Megillah doesn't have Hashem's name, as you know. So you create this holy object without Hashem's name. And once we're talking about that, well, there's a Mishnah which talks about generally holy texts. And that's in the first chapter of Masechet Megillah, Mishnah Chet, the eighth Mishnah. Ein ben sfarim litfilim umuzuzot. What's the difference between tefillin and Sfarim, highly holy uh, books, whether it's the Chumash, let's say, whether it's a Sefer Torah, what's going to be the difference? Again, actually, theoretically, the suggestion there is that you could write Sifre Kodesh. You may remember this from studying it in translation. Rabbi Shimon Gavliel says only in Greek, and nowadays we don't know that Greek. A whole question of whether or not you could write a Sefer Torah in another language. What makes for this holy Sefer Torah? And in the end, the pinnacle of Kedusha is the Sefer Torah, and it must be in the original Hebrew. And then we have a, a quote which I brought from Masechet Shabbat, which talks about a big discussion, which gets quite, quite, quite strong about how we relate to all kinds of holy books, yes, whether it's the Chumash or later books, which are in translation, like the book of Job in translation. And is that a good thing or deeply problematic? Depends who translated it. Depends how good a translation it is. What was the attitude of the person who translated it? We're talking about the early period of Christianity. Are there other kinds of translations going on with different agendas? Translation becomes something very, very interesting, but very multifaceted. And we again have the question, how do we relate to a text which is a translation with maybe a very different agenda, right? So we get all these questions of holy texts. That's one kind of holy object. Then we get the beginning of what's the third parak in Mishnah, but in the Gemara is the beginning of the fourth chapter, which is the question of selling a shul, selling a street, selling a the box that holds the Sefer Torah, the Aron selling the Sefer Torah itself. What can you do? You always have to go upward in terms of Kedusha. So Kedusha, holiness, sanctity, isn't an all or nothing concept, right? You can go upward from one to the next, but never down. You can't sell a Sefer Torah in order to build a nice shoe, right? You can move upward, uh, but you can't move downward. And we get a wonderful argument, which could not be more relevant than today, about what we do about a street where people tend to daven. I don't know about most of you, but I've got a parking lot in front of my house, and there's still davening there every day, three times a day in this parking lot. Is it still a parking lot or is it a shul? Right? That's a machloket. It's a difference of opinion. How do we relate to it? What can I do there? Can I still comfortably park my car? What's going on? Did it completely change character because of this temporary prayer there, which got to be rather permanent? So what do we do about intermediary kind of spaces and objects and buildings? And where does Kedusha come in and out? Then we have another discussion. On that discussion in the Mishnah, on Daf Kafva. Page 26b, in case you've got a Gemara and want to take a quick look. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbi said, Tash mitzvah nizrakim, tash kedusha nignazim. Objects used to do a mitzvah get thrown out. It's true, I'm sure you learned it, that Judaism couldn't live with that. We couldn't live with that. So we moved it to, well, but don't throw it out in a way that's not respectful. But really the original halacha is, 
Tashmishe, mitzvah, an object you use for a mitzvah like a lulav. And when it's finished, it's finished. It's over. But Tashmishe, Kedusha, not only the Sefer Torah itself, but the box you put the Sefer Torah in, the cloth you used around it, that stays holy. So Tashmishe, Kedusha are very different from Tashmishe, Mitzvah. It's kind of anti-intuitive. I would have thought my 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 lulav would be more have more holiness than the cover to a sefer Torah. But no, the sefer Torah has God's name in it. It has a text which is, as Rabbi Michelle said, there's a purity to it, an authenticity to it, and that has kedusha. And therefore, the thing which we kept to, to around it keeps a certain kedusha, as against an object which is something you just can throw out afterwards. It's You used it, but then its use is over in some kind of way. Then we move on to, so that's another limitation as to what has holiness. Objects that you use for mitzvahs don't have holiness. It's different. There's something different about it. Holiness is about something that somehow connects to God in a way that it lasts, in a kind of way that the God's uh, eternalness which we don't have, eternity, which we don't have when it comes to objects we do mitzvahs with. And then we have our biggest surprise. So we have a limitation so far in terms of imperfect texts, translations which are not, which can be ambiguous, which can be different, which can be inexact, uh, texts written not exactly the right way. Then we have an, another limitation, another symptom in terms of objects that were for mitzvahs as against objects which contain the text, a holy text. And then we have the most surprising one, which is actually in Masechet Yadayim, in another Masechet altogether, I don't know if you came across this one yet, which is to do with the idea that the rabbis decided to assign impurity to holy objects. Imagine the idea, it sounds absurd. We think of impurity as some kind of taboo, it's out there, it's far away. This is very important, I think, for us as women that impurity is not some kind of taboo. On the contrary. Why did they do that? Because the Sifrei Torah, it would seem the reason was that Sifrei Torah were being stored together with truma, with which was food. And along when there's food, what are there? Little mice. And the mice were nibbling at the Sifrei Torah. So what did they say? Okay, everybody, Sifrei Torah have a certain level of impurity. You can't store them together with the food. That's what happened. So, the last thing we would have expected, they decided to put together two categories we would have never thought of putting together, which is impurity and the greatest sanctity, the greatest holiness, and said, that's it. When you touch a Sefer Torah, it creates a certain level of impurity for you, right? Um, really surprising. So how could they do that? How could they relate to the, this, as we were looking at, Rabbi Michelle was just teaching about the laws of, of the Sefer Torah and be careful and not touching and all that. And suddenly they were quite happy to nevertheless assign purity to it. And how could this be? So I want to make a few suggestions. The first suggestion I want to make is that from a practical point of view, we live in the world. And therefore, we can't have a situation that any impingement of Kedusha creates total Kedusha. We can't have it if that... If we decide to, 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 to daven once in, in the parking lot, or even for a few times, but in an impermanent way, it's no longer a parking lot. It is a parking lot. It's a parking lot we also prayed in. Some things are dynamically, that's a shul, and then it has its holiness. But some things are both, and they don't immediately, from a practical point of view, we can't end up with the whole world because it touched me. And not only that, I think it's a lesson that things, everyday things, can also share in the world of Kedusha without becoming holy objects or holy places. That doesn't mean they can't share in potential for Kedusha. The potential for Kedusha is everywhere. It's not just in those objects. So every time there's a bit of praying somewhere, we don't say, oh, that's now only a, a holy place in comparison to others. So there's a kind of both practical and thoughtful kind of aspect to allowing for the fact that Kedusha Holy prayers can occur in a place without it immediately, the meaning of that place totally changing. That's one. The next thing I think has to do with authenticity, the problem of getting the text right, 
and not all texts are going to hold up holiness, that you need a sofer to write it, a scribe to write it with a certain intention, with a certain purity in his, 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 his thoughts. To make a Sefer Torah, it's not that simple. There's all sorts of questions. What do we do about printed material? What is its level of holiness? To make a Sefer Torah has a certain, it's a goal. And it's not that easy to do. And again, when we get to translation, because of the ambiguity, because of the different visions of the translators, uh, Jessica Sachs, who does a lot of translation of um, Sidurim, Tanakh, she talks magnificently about the ideas and the thought that have to go into any particular translation, how you think about it. And you can't, if you don't know who the translators and how much work was gone in, and you can never catch the, a poem completely into another language. It won't be quite the same. The ambiguity, the ambivalence that, that, that there is, both in law and in poetry, will never be complete. And so the pinnacle of holiness will only be in the original. That's not all holiness. There'll still be a certain level of sanctity, but the pinnacle will stay in the original text with the name of God. But I think there's another reason which actually runs counter to everything I've said so far. And that is that there's a problem with assigning holiness to objects. There's a problem with icons. There's a problem with objects becoming too important. We don't want the object to come in place of the act. We don't want the object to come instead of the relationship with God. We don't want the object to come instead of God. We don't want the object to become an icon. We want the object to remain something that we use towards a relationship with God, something that helps us create. The same way we want our learning to be something which creates a relationship. We want the, the, the reading of the Megillah, the act, to be the supreme, not the Megillah itself. For all the laws about it, it's going to be the reading from it that's going to matter more than how I keep it. It's important how I keep it as a part of it. But if I keep it in my closet and I never read it, if I have this great Gemara on the shelf, but I never touch it, I never open it, then it hasn't done what it needs to do. So there's a, there's a worry in overdoing holiness of objects. They, that the object shouldn't become the main point, but what's in it and what's in it for a relationship. And I think this we can see from another little line, a tiny line that gets ignored on Dat Kaf Vav Amud Bet on 26b, which was Amma Mazutra, Mitpachot Sfarim Shebalu, the coverings, the cloth coverings around Sifrei Torah that eventually wore out. What do we do with them? We can't throw them out. They're holy because they held holiness. So in theory, we have to Lignos, we have to put them in a geniza. We have to um, conceal them. But what should we do with them? What did they do with them? What's a good idea to do them? Use them to make tachrichim lemeit mitzvah. If a person dies and there's no one to care for them and bury them, it's called a meit mitzvah. It's a mitzvah and whoever gets there first to bury this person. It's a mitzvah in the community to bury this person. V'zohi genizatan. What is the best way of geniza, of respectful hiding away, concealment, and keeping of this worn out Torah cover is to sew it up as clothes for a mate mitzvah, someone who was left, who didn't have someone to bury them and to use it for that. In a sense, it comes full circle. The, the cloth for the Torah becomes the cloth for somebody who could try to keep Torah, yes? And for the respect to that, that that there's um, that the real um, holiness comes in the marriage between the Megillah and the reader, between the Torah and its reader. It, one without the other is empty. So uh, Masechet Megillah really is about the fact that as like I'm, as on Purim, appearances aren't all of what it is. The, there's something inside that has to happen. There's something hidden that has to happen. And that's the magic between the text, the holiness, and our relationship, our experience of it, which creates, creates our relationship with God. 
Thank you, Michelle, Reverend Michelle, for inviting me to join you. It's really a very exciting thing to do. And may you enjoy your learning tremendously. Thank you very much, Reverend Aguila. That was beautiful, very beautiful concept. And it was a nice way to kind of close all these ideas that we had seen throughout the Masechet and bring them together. We're going to end our program tonight with something very special, which you don't see all the time, which is a, an initiative by a high school in Israel, Pelech Tel Aviv, where I have to say two of my daughters went and go, um, where a teacher who we're going to meet right now, very briefly, Moria Ben Chai, is going to speak to us very briefly about the initiative that she took within her school. And then we're going to be very excited. We're going to hear from an eighth grader in her school, Eliana Kulak, who took on the Dafiomi Challenge and is now hooked and uh, is going to share with us a few words. So, Moria. Yay. Hello. I'm really thrilled to be here. Wow, it's really exciting. And, and so many people are here. Wow. Um, so I'm a school of Rabbanit um, at Pelech Tel Aviv, and we are one of the few schools in Israel that teach girls Gemara uh, for the Bagrut in a high level. And last year, when I when I was teaching the seventh grader uh, Masechet Megillah, only few sugiot, uh, one of them asked me if we we're going to finish the Masechet. Well, it's really bold question for a seventh grader who only met Gmara that year uh, to ask about that. But I thought, well, why not? <laughs> and then I looked for Masachet um, Begla de Dafyomi, and I and I saw it's going to be this year. And about two months ago, I connected uh, Rabbi Michelle Farber and asked her to lead us, lead the way, and um, actually to use the podcast of, of Hadran to um, uh, to succeed with the challenge of Dafyomi. And so we went uh, for a, a Daf Yomi, Edgara Daf Yomi, the challenge. And actually a few dozens of students and teachers uh, came along, but only 13, but actually it's really, it's, it's thrilling, 13 students. Most of them are seventh and eighth graders and only one uh, is 17, uh, finished the Masechet. I'm really, really, really proud of them. And we used WhatsApp group, we used some memes, and we had classes, and of course the podcast every day. And Eliana is actually uh, is is my student in my homeroom uh, class, so I'm really proud of her. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Eliana Kulak. Um, I'm in eighth grade, and I met Alia from New York a few years ago. Um, I live in Ronana and go to school at Pell Tel Aviv. Um, and I just want to say, first of all, it's such an honor to be here completing Masachat Megillah alongside this inspiring group of women. Um, I was first introduced to Daf Yomi through the Hadron Pelach program that you just heard about from my amazing Gemara teacher, Mar Moria. And learning Daf Yomi with the Hadron community has transformed the past month for me. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit about my experience um, learning Daf Yomi with um, you. Uh, Masachat Megillah was a perfect foray into Daf Yomi, and its themes on halachot often resonated with me. One recurring theme that I want to talk about is the importance of accessibility, meaning there's a huge value placed on ensuring Jewish knowledge and Masora is never out of reach. Chazal are accommodating to people who live in Farim and Mikalachot um, to give them access to Megillah reading. They allow Megillah reading in other languages because they want non-Hebrew speakers to be included in understanding Megillah. And to me, this is what the whole Daf Yomi movement is about, accessibility, making the huge accomplishment of finishing Shas um, available to the layman, although um, in the beginning, more emphasis on the man part of layman. Um, and 100 years after Daf Yomi started, the Pelech Hadron iteration has now made it accessible for me as an eighth grade girl and Nuala um, to learn Daf Yomi. It gave me a community of other girls my age who were learning Daf Yomi. And because of that, I saw it as something that was open to me. The podcast gave me a medium for learning that's accessible and I'm used to interacting with. I think um, this is a time when everything is accessible at the push of a button. And the internet allows people to access like, the biggest body of knowledge ever in a very approachable way. But for me, and I think a lot of other teenage girls, the Talmud can seem really distant uh, and out of reach, like an ancient text in a foreign language. But through Daf Yomi, Talmud and Chazal become part of Megali life and therefore more approachable and less daunting. 
I really just hope that more girls get the opportunity to try Duff Yomi because it really enriched all facets of my life and added this morsel of spirituality to every, to every day. Um, and I'm just, I'm really grateful for Hadron and Pella for giving me that opportunity. And I think it's, it's an amazing thing that we should um, allow more, more young women to do. Amazing. Thank you, Eliana. We're looking forward to seeing what's going to become of you, because if you're like this in eighth grade, <laughs> you've got a bright future ahead of you. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. Thank you all for all the support and all the learning and all being part of this. And uh, thank you for all those who joined the Circle of Friends, all those who gave contributions at the end of the year. We're very thankful. It helps us to be able to increase our programming. And uh, Maggie, you want to add a word? Um, yes, I mean, mazal to, first of all, to all of you completing, especially those who just wrote that this was their first Masechet, so great job. Um, many of you know that there are two more Masechet and we will be completing Seder Moed and we're already working really hard to make it an exciting Siyum for everybody. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you to save the date yet, can I say? <laughs> we will be having the Siyum on March 8th, so save that date. Um, not on a Sunday, so you really shouldn't save the date. Um, we're very excited. Another thing we're excited about is our new Facebook page that we are focusing in English. Everything in that page will be in English. Some of you might have already seen that in our intro video, um, but I'm now putting the link in our chat. Please go to the page and like it. It's a very easy way to show your support for Hadron. Um, and yeah, I think that that is it. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And we'll see you soon at the next Zoom or tomorrow morning. <laughs> this year. Next Zoom is already in less than a month. So we'll see you all soon. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Yashkoch, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Mazal well, tov to everybody. And Mazal tov. Mazal tov. Mazal tov. So wonderful.